Hi everyone. Welcome to the latest episode from Lessons from the Playroom podcast. Today we are going to do something a little different. Um, the tables are going to be turned back my direction here in a moment. And, uh, and there's a really important person that's with me to turn the tables. Um, I have with me Robert Abel Jr who is my operations director at the Synergetic Play Therapy Institute, who um, we're gonna talk about hard decisions and uh, what it takes to make hard decisions, the courage it takes to make hard decisions, um, why we don't make the hard decisions um, sometimes. And, uh, and Robert, I want you to share a little bit about you and, uh, and then I'm gonna turn this over to you to facilitate this conversation. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, thanks, um, Robert. Well, gosh, decisions, making decisions every day. Um, I think for me, I mean, I've been in the world of education, teaching. Um, so, you know, working with students and parents and, and doing all those things, it's making decisions uh, on a regular basis there. And then you know, as growing up, you know, very different time for me growing up. But um, when I grew up in, you know, the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, there was a lot of decisions that had to be made for myself personally on um, the journey of coming out as a gay man. Um, and so uh, it's really going to be an interesting conversation that we have today and uh, talk about these not only decisions that we make in our professional life, but in, in personal lives as well. Yeah, I so I so appreciate you. Um, so grateful for you, and grateful that I have um, a, a, someone on this journey that understands, appreciates, and that I can even have this conversation with. So, thank you for just thank you for doing this with me. No problem. Well. Yeah. Um, well, let's, do this. let's turn it around. Let's let's let me do this, huh? Mm -hmm. um, so, Lisa, what do you think? Why is it hard for people to make decisions sometimes? Yeah, because it's true, okay. <laughs> right? Even when we know it's the decision we really really need to make, and yeah, it's still so hard to make make that make the decision. Um, I want to talk about it from the brain. And then I also want to talk about it from a, like a relational perspective. So, and they're actually really, uh, really intertwined. Um, so the first thing that I think is just interesting for people to understand is that, and, and this goes back into our evolution. So when we go back into our evolution, um, our survival was dependent upon being connected in a group. Like that was the basis of our survival. And so if in some ways you went against the group norms or you wanted to leave the group or you were different than the group or you were shunned from the group, it, it literally was a matter of survival. You know, if you think about it from that perspective, if you're thrown out into the elements, right? well, there could be a tiger around the corner, you know, um, and, and you are, and you are on your own. So it's important for people to understand that the wiring in the brain around survival is intimately connected with fitting in really, really, really connected. And so when we talk about making a hard decision, oftentimes we're making a decision because we feel like we're trying to stay true to ourselves in some way, you know, or mm -hmm. something that feels deeply congruent for us. But that decision may not be the norm. It may go against um, thinking. It may go against what people expect of you. Okay. Totally right. It may go against uh, so many people's you know projections of like who you are and what you're supposed to do. And so it's this interesting battle of like, can I be true to me, and can I be authentically me, and potentially leave the group or deal with the consequences of making the decision that might have some consequences right attached to it. So it's actually, it's really hard just from like a biology perspective. I think that's, yeah. I think that's the first, the first place. Well, and I, while you're talking about this, I'm thinking, God, high school, <laughs> you know, you're 
you're going through these changes in your body and then you got to decide what to do what group what group yeah who, who am I? yeah who do i, who I? belong yeah. on and if i go here is that going to make a difference if i go here is that going to what clubs do i join totally well and, <laughs> and even uh at that stage separating from family norms right you know what if all of a sudden i don't believe what my family believes yeah. Or I have a different perspective than my, than the, the family, or I have different values than my family. Like, oh, you know, there's um, a lot of potential sort of consequence in that, which is the, the second piece I want to talk about, which is that there's, um, you know, it's not just that we're wired to, in some ways, not make the hard decision in some ways, right? At least consciously. Um, but we're also incredibly afraid of rejection. Like I don't, I've never met anybody on some level who wasn't afraid of not being accepted, not being loved for who they are, right? Not being rejected in some way. And so this, the fear of rejection, right? If I'm really me, if I make that hard decision, if I speak up, if I say what I need to say, if I, if I, you know, if I um, leave that company, if I, uh, you know, if I, whatever, do things, I mean, like there's so many decisions, right? If I, whatever it is, um, the reality is, and I think this is important for everyone to hear. The reality is, is that some people are not going to like you. Right. They're like, they're like, they're, they're not. And I think sometimes, well, let me add another biology piece, Robert, our, um, we'll call it our animal brain, mm -hmm. our animal brain, the part that's wired for survival is incredibly focused on something called the pain pleasure principle. And what that means is that it, it wants to feel good. That's what it means, right? And it will do anything at any cost to avoid uh, the thing that feels bad, the challenge, the hard thing, like whatever it is, because it wants to just stay, it, wa it, wants, to, it wants to feel good, totally. Yep. And so um, the, the idea that someone is not going to appreciate, accept, like, um, is also a, a, a pain point because when we make decisions, it, it is impossible for everyone to agree yeah. with the hard decisions that we make. Some yeah. people will think it's a great idea and some people will think um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an awful idea. Can I give an, an example of this? Absolutely. Let's... So Robert, um, I mean, you know, you know, my history. So um, my, uh, my ex-husband and I, when we decided to get a divorce, Avery was four years old. And this was one of my fears. One of my fears was, oh my goodness, what are people going to think of me if I get this divorce? Anyway, I got the divorce and it was a, it was a mixed bag of, of, of responses. There were some individuals that were incredibly, you know, supportive. And then there were other individuals, not so much. In fact, I even remember having a student, Robert, when the student found out I got a divorce, she told me that I was a disappointment. Oh. And the reason why I was a disappointment was because she had me on a pedestal. And in her perspective, I had it all, yep. including the marriage. Right. And so... And so where was she going to find the hope to have it all if Lisa Dion can't, is, you know, isn't even staying in her marriage, right? And it was like, that was, a, that was a really hard decision because I know I still needed to be true to me, even if people agreed with me or didn't, and, and if people said things, it's just like one of many, but I think that just speaks to that whole piece, right, of like, we all want to be liked, we all want people to like our decisions, and the reality is, is that they're just not going to. And if we have a fantasy that somehow they're all going to, that's actually going to add to the pain of making the hard decision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think about, as you were talking through that, I'm like, I wish I knew this when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And now you try to talk, tell people like, hey, make those hard decisions. It's, it's you know, it, but what if, but what if, and I think of, for me, that's what I hear a lot of people get stuck in the what ifs, mm -hmm. but what if this, and then your favorite quote, right? The shoulds, Yeah. well, I should do this. And they think about the, you know, as you're growing up, you know, what do you want to do when you get older? I want to be 
oh no, you know, and what should I be, or what if I'm this, and you know, a prime example, you know, people. I became an educator, and probably the only one in my family to get anything higher than a high school diploma, much less have a doctorate. And you know, when I was growing up, that was the you know what. What do you want to be? Well, I want to be a teacher. Why do you want to be a teacher? Go be a doctor, make some money, go be a lawyer, do this. And so it, it's, it's very. Yeah. That is a, uh, a hot topic in my household right now with Avery, who um, is about to turn 18. And, and that, that is, that is the constant question, mom, how do I be me? How do yeah. I keep making those decisions knowing that not everyone is going to, not everyone's going to like me, or I don't agree with part of how, you know, my friends are doing things or I, you know, part of the, uh, the culture right now at my school, I don't agree with, but if I don't go along with it, will I have any friends? I mean, like it, that is the topic of conversation, right? Like how do we, how do we have the courage to be ourselves and make those, and make those, make those really, really hard, hard decisions. And she's going into like, the next stage in her life, college. I mean, yeah. that's even harder. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, kind of turning it back to what you do in a day to day is what of uh, hard decisions do play therapists have to make? Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots. So, gosh, everything from needing to have that conversation. So play therapist, I know you can resonate this as I'm saying this, but you, you know, there's that conversation you need to have with the kids, um, caregivers, like you, you know, you need to have it. And it's really scary to have it because again, there's the fear of rejection. They're going to, they're not going to like me. They're going to pull their kid from therapy. They're going to get mad at me, you know, all of that. Um, that's a really big one that, 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 that happens. Um, I think a lot of play therapists also find themselves at some point in their career of having to think about how do I want to be a play therapist? Like, what does that look like? And sometimes that comes with hard decisions. So do I, um, you know, really common one might be like, I've been working for an organization and I'm at the point where I feel like I need to leave the organization either to go be with another organization or to start my private practice. And that's a really scary, just hard decision, right, to make. Um, and then I'll go the other end. There are a lot of play therapists that are in the field for a significant, significant period of time. They've invested so much time and energy. And then one day they wake up and they go, I don't know if I want to work with kids anymore. And, and the field doesn't talk about it's okay to change. It's okay. It's okay right. to all of a sudden discover something different. It's okay to put your energy into, into something else. Like that's totally fine. Right. And um, yeah. And so how do you, how do you make that decision and say that out loud? You right. know, like, sorry, I've decided I don't want to work with kids anymore. Um, yeah. Another one that comes up for a lot of individuals is they still want to work with kids, but they don't want to work directly with kids. Mm -hmm. They've decided, you know what, I just want to be a supervisor mm -hmm. or I want to be a trainer. And right. there's um, guilt that I hear come up sometimes for play therapists. Like, but what does that mean if I'm not working directly with kids? Does that mean I'm a bad therapist? What will people think of me if I, if they know I'm not like direct directively offering the services? And so there's a there's a lot of like hard decisions, um, even in the play therapy room itself, Robert. You know, there's something wow. happening in the session, and maybe there's a boundary that needs to be set, or maybe something needs to be there's a conversation that needs to happen with the kid. And it's like, oh, let me muster up that energy to be able to do that because I don't want to, I don't want to hurt the kid's feelings. I don't want to shame the child. I don't want to. So yeah, there's a lot of, I really kind of think, I almost feel like we could say a hard decision is anytime we feel like rejection is on the other side. Do you know what I yeah. mean? And that could be everything from like a monumental life choice to just saying something like, Hey, I didn't really appreciate that. Or I didn't like that to gosh, like so many other things in between, you know? Yeah. And that all, as you're talking through that, I'm like, that all resonates with me, you know, not just with play therapists. I'm like teachers, I'm like you hear like right now, there's a lot of teachers leaving the profession and it's not because of the kids. They just have to make hard decisions on 
their life choices. Like, what do, what do I need to survive? And, you know, is this, you know, yeah. is this really what I wanted to do? And it, it, so you see that in a lot of professions too. I mean, I had to make that decision myself after almost over 20 years in higher education to step down in a role that, you know, I was at the, the pinnacle of my career in education and decide, hey, I need, it's time for me to do something different. That's when you and I met. <laughs> I know, that's when I snagged you. <laughs> Lucky us. <laughs> uh, yeah, totally. Um, uh, so now, and this is just kind of as you're talking through, I'm like, you know, we recognize that there's hard decisions that have to be made. You know, we, we have that written, we're thinking, oh my God, that rejection is there. It's uncomfortable for me, right? If I have this conversation, what's going to happen? But what happens when we don't make hard decisions? Oh, that's, I think that might be the most important question <laughs> that's been asked so far. Because um, here's the thing. There is something inside each one of us that won't let us get away with it. Right. And, uh, and so like, what does that mean? When we are not being true to ourselves, when we are not being congruent, when we know there's something we have to do, we know it and we're not doing it. We know there's something we have to say and we're not saying it, right? We know we have to make that choice, but we're like, just so afraid to, um, our body starts talking to us. That's the, that's the first, one of the first places that we get feedback is that uh, we start to um, get signs and symptoms in our body. So our body starts to, we may experience more internal anxiety. We might start to experience, uh, you know, experience of depression. Um, we, our immune system actually takes a big old whack. Yep. Um, we make ourselves more susceptible to illness. Um, our body literally starts talking to us. And this for me, I, I want to add this in here too, for the, those that are listening. Um, so often we're, we're taught to dismiss the feedback in our body, or we're taught that somehow it's bad, like go get rid of it, but we're not often, or fix it, you know, go, you know, go make it better. But we're not often taught to just pause and go, why is my body talking to me? Like before we get into what do I do about it, but like, why, why am I having more symptoms? Why am I feeling more, um, uh, why am I getting sick? Why am I getting more injuries? Why am I getting like, like why, what is the feedback going on? And then simultaneous to our bodies, the brain noise kicks up. Hmm. So we'll start to hear louder brain noise. Um, the shoulds get really loud. The shouldn'ts get really loud. And so it's almost like our internal world and our mind and then our internal world and our body starts screaming at us, please be yourself. I mean, that's like really the ultimate message, right? Like, please be yourself. Please make that hard decision. Please, you know, get us congruent. But the other thing I want to add in here too, is that it's actually quite painful to walk through the world, not able to fully express ourselves. It's like really painful actually. Um, and it's really painful to not feel uh, like we can be ourselves in the world or known for, for, for ourselves in the world. And, um, and so when we're making, we're not making those hard decisions, we're also not letting ourselves be known. We're not actually fully expressed. We're not actually um, allowing someone or other people to fully love us for who we actually are. I think that's a big one for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes us susceptible to addiction. I think that's an important one for people to hear yep. because the pain is so tolerable that it, it remember back to that pain pleasure principle, yep. right? It's so, it's so intolerable to um, not be ourselves that it, it becomes more attractive to do the thing or use the thing that gives us a little bit of that dopamine hit, that gives us a little bit of a feel good, that gives us a little bit of a, of a something that allows us to feel good for the moment. And so, um, yeah, it's interesting that we're tying this together, but not making hard decisions leads to 
incongruency in our own authenticity, which leads to feedback systems in our mind and our body, which can lead to us being more susceptible, uh, more um, susceptible, excuse me, to a, addictive processes, to try to feel good, to try to tolerate that. That's um, huge. 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 It's huge. And as you were talking about that, I was like, wow. Because I don't think I've ever told you what I wrote my dissertation on. I'm not sure. Share. My dissertation was on LGBT population, 18 to 25 uh, males. Mm -hmm. And it was on family acceptance, internalized sexual stigma, and substance abuse. Mm -hmm. And how all of those really played a role in somebody's acceptance in who they were and then coming to terms with that. And so all the things that you were just talking about, the feedback and the 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 brain noise and you know the, the, the how to cope. For me, it's that how do you cope with that? And that comes with the alcoholism or the drug abuse or and it's all because of you're not able to make the hard decision. I can't hard decision. I can't I'm not yep. speaking up. I'm not yep. sharing who I actually <laughs> Not being my authentic self. Not being my authentic self. And, and here's something I think it's important for play therapists to recognize that this isn't just adults. This is kids too. A yeah. lot of the, I mean, so Robert, you know, one of the, the tenets in synergetic play therapy is that we support the child in discovering who, you know, what their authentic self is, right? Who they actually are versus who they think they should be. I mean, this is like so hand in hand. Um, but a lot of uh, kids, um, are forced to be someone that they're not, yeah. right? They're forced to fit into a, an environment. They're forced to fit into family norms, the family belief systems, um, cultural norms, cultural belief systems, and it doesn't actually align with who they actually are. Right. And they're also, I mean, it's interesting to think of that as like a three-year-old, you yeah. know, or a five-year-old or an eight-year-old of like, how does a three-year-old make this kind of a hard decision? It's so hard. Can they even, I mean, some, I think someone could argue, are they even in the position to be able to? And so if they can't, you know, or we can talk about um, someone that's in a marginalized population, like, can they really make the heart decision? I think that's an important piece. Is it actually safe enough to make the heart decision? And then when it's not, then what? Right. And, and then we, and then we go into all of these other pieces and then there's the, you know, the, the consequences and the ramifications of, you know, of all of that. It's so big. Huge. It's just so a decision. Yeah. What about like a decision? A decision. Right. A decision. And, and not to minimize it, but it's it just, you have to make a decision and that's yes. it. Like, yeah. and, and all of this just wrapped around that, that One challenge. Decision. That challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, totally. <laughs> And uh, so one of the things that while we were sitting here and I was thinking about because play therapists, I mean, they're in a very uh, critical role when, with working with children, obviously. And so I guess the question is how, how do you navigate the decision-making process when it has to do with the well-being of this child? Like you think about legal and, and uh, mandated reporting requirements and things like that. Like, oh, yeah, there's another hard decision that right. play therapists have to make. Yeah, I mean, at, at least in the in the field, I think that's why support is so important mm -hmm. and why supervision is so key and consultation is so key because sometimes, well, I'm going to say this in all, maybe this is just my bias here, but like, I feel like, we all need support when we're making a hard decision, no matter what the decision is in in life. Like we, we, we need to, we, we need to know, right. That there are people that um, have our back, right. We need to know that there are people that, um, that, you know, that believe in us, that support us. And that's true in the supervision consultation to know that there are two individuals, for example, looking at a case that are, that are in collaboration about what needs to happen for this child. And so there's a bit of leaning on each other for support or the primary therapist leaning on somebody for support with someone being like, you can do this. This is what needs to be done. 
you know, I'm here with you in this process. If it gets hard, if you've got to go to court, we'll, we'll practice this, we'll get you the support. Like, I think that that whole, uh, that whole piece is critical, you know? And so maybe we can just say that, don't make hard decisions in isolation. <laughs> we just go with that, you know, like find at least one person, find at least one person that you can really lay it all out with that can be there in the journey with you. And I think that I, I appreciate that because I think that is important. Like, I think you need somebody to, because I think if there's a lot of people that get caught up in the, I don't want to, I don't want to share what's going on in my life and, you know, the hard decision I have to make about whatever it is with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And then now they know, but in reality, it's helpful, like crucial really, because if you don't have that support and then you make the hard decision, then what? Totally. And if we go back to the brain, if I know I need to sort of leave the norm or if mm -hmm. I need to leave the group or if I need to do something that's risky, if I know that there's going to be people on the other side or at least another group I can plug into, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It, it actually tempers the fear response in the brain. Because then I know I'm not, I'm not alone. I'm not actually going to go out by myself and get eaten by the tiger, uh, that there will be somebody or some buddies that are there that, uh, that will help me if I need to face the tiger, so to speak, you know? So I do, I think that that's critical, even from a sense of safety and survival in the brain. And that totally resonates because, and it doesn't have to just be like a supervisor or a, because I think about the research that I did, it's family of choice. You know, you have your family, but if you're making a hard decision where you know that you're not going to get the support of your family, well, now you've got to go out and find yeah. support. Yeah. And so now you've developed this whole family of choice, which in my journey, that's what I did. I had a family of choice that was there that, you know, when I made the hard decision, I didn't have to worry. Like, I know I've got support and it wasn't from a family, my family now, you know, obviously they ended up supporting me later on in life, but, you know, initially the, the, the shock of everything, it was, you know, I needed the support of other folks and that, and I also, that was included in the, what I wrote in my dissertation, you know, finding that family of, of choice to support you. Uh, yeah. Really finding, your, finding your colleagues of choice. Right. Right. Yeah. And your supervisor, your supervisors right. of choice. Yeah. Robert, I'm so, I'm so glad that you had that. Yeah. 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 Me too. I, you know, I, I think, uh, and interesting enough, my mentor, the person that uh, he just recently passed away. Like, I mean, I was like, geez, was he that old? <laughs> like, but, but had I not had him in my life and I mean, he was one of many, but I don't know if I'd be where I'm at today. Oh, I, I, I want to tie what you just said there into the role of play therapist. Play therapist, I, I hope you just heard something in there that um, is meaningful for your role. You know, because Robert, I heard I heard you say there were many, but there was a significant individual that made a that made a real difference. And so play therapists with our kids that are struggling to be themselves and they're struggling their authenticity and they're struggling to make that hard decision speak up to the bully or tell their parents quit trying to put me into you know into into dance i hate dance you know i would rather whatever like quit trying to force me into you know education i hate school like those are things that kids have to learn to speak up about right like this is who i am stop trying to make me someone that i'm not and on that journey, we get to maybe be part of their um, family of choice in a sense. Like we get to be an adult in their life that that really helps them understand that who they are and what's meaningful for them, whatever it is, is actually intrinsically beautiful. And they don't actually have to change who they are to to fit, to fit in. And, and yeah, so Great. yeah, that was, that was, I think sometimes play therapists need reminders like, yes, we are doing something. Yes actually doing something pretty significant so, well how about you lisa you're i have to say 
you know, having known you for the time that I have, you are an inspirational lady, wonderful woman. I know a lot of people have you on a pedestal, but you've had to make hard decisions in your life and in your career. So do you want to share maybe a hard decision you've had to make in your life or career that that took me to my knees. <laughs> yeah. Your support and, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sure. Well, I shared the one about, um, you know, when uh, Avery's uh, dad and I decided to uh, to separate. Um, and then, you know, career-wise, I feel like I've had to make many hard decisions. I think one that maybe sometimes isn't necessarily thought of as a hard decision but it was actually an incredibly hard decision was even creating synergetic play therapy. Mm. Just the, just the, I, you know, having an idea and having a sense about a process and then having the courage to, to say, I, I want to talk about it. Mm. Um, I'm seeing something a little different. I'm understanding things in a little bit of a different way than I'm hearing being talked about. Um, and, and, you know, and when I did, I had people, it was, it was the full range, right? I had people that were like, oh my gosh, this just like completely lights me up. And then I had other people looking at me sideways going, what are you doing? Like, you can't do that. You can't say that. And so there was, and I would say, you know, that that's been, I think uh, at times in the journey with synergetic play therapy is these, um, every time within me, I feel like I want to add something new or I want to contribute something new, or I want to say something a little different. I know that I am at some level going to be met with individuals that don't like what I'm doing. Absolutely. And that's just how that goes. Right. Um, it doesn't make it easy to do, even though I know that logically and I can expect it, it doesn't make it any easier because that, that feeling of, but I, I want to be accepted in the, you know, and I, and I want, I mean, that's all still there, right? It's still in my biology, but I've, I've learned to trust if I don't, well, all those signs and symptoms that we were talking about, right? Start to kick in. Right. And if I don't. I feel like there's some part of myself that starts to feel like it's being trapped or stifled in some way. And the pain of that at the end of the day is much greater than the pain of um, rejection. One of my favorite quotes is coming to, to mind. And the quote is, I would rather have the whole world against me than me against my own soul. And that, that for me is like a really, really powerful quote. Like, how do I just keep staying true to myself and making those hard decisions? But, but yeah, there've been many hard decisions along the way with just the creation of synergetic play therapy. Um, you know, synergetic play therapy wasn't in the Institute when it first started, wasn't, wasn't the Institute. It wasn't this global thing when I first started. And so each iteration of growth has required a new decision and the decisions around um, what are we going to do, keep doing, and what are we no longer going to do, right. right? That Those decisions at times have impacted our students. Those decisions at times have impacted the people that work for us, right, Robert? Um, those decisions impact um, many people. And so even just as a business owner, having to make hard decisions every single step of the way, um, there have been times that, you know, where it's like, um, no, like someone has to go. Those are hard decisions. And, and those are decisions around my authenticity and their authenticity. Like, I don't want someone, I want someone, if I value my own authenticity, I'm valuing their authenticity too, right? Which means they need to go where they need to go and I need to be where I, where I am, right? But it doesn't make those kinds of decisions any, any, less, any less tricky, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, there's, there's just been so, it's almost like every, every time I grow into a new, a new awareness of me 
or the institute grows into its next iteration of whatever it is, a hard decision has to be made. Yeah. What's coming with me? What's not coming with me? And that could be people, that could be situations, that could be belief systems, that could be, but not everything gets to come along on the journey. Right. Yeah. Mm. And it, it, what you said, something you said just, I was like, you know, it's that fear of rejection. Like it's really, and, and I think that goes for anybody in any type of organization, whether it's play therapist or teacher or business owner, or like there's that fear of, you know, hey, I'm going to, if I leave this organization, Lisa's not going to like me anymore. Right. Or if I do this, they're not going to like me or it's, it, and so, you know, and, and I, I said in the beginning of this, like my decision to leave education after 20 years, I had those like, oh my God, like, what about my students that I'm, I've worked with for so long or my, my boss who I've worked with for so long, like, what are they going to think? And so, you know, it's, Oh, I just thought of a really big one, um, Robert, when COVID hit. Yep. So uh, we had our actual, you know, physical space. We had our training institute and, you know, we were actually seeing clients, you know, in, uh, in Boulder County, as well as training, you know, uh, therapists. And we made the decision to let it all go and just go completely virtual. And wow, some people did not like that decision. Wow, you're going to stop doing direct services as an organization and you're just going to focus on training? What? You know, um, uh, even just the thought of, you know, wait, what does a virtual institute even look like? What does that, what does that mean? Um, I remember being worried about disappointing, you know, at the time, I know a lot of people were making decisions about letting go of their leases but that also put the owners of buildings in really interesting scenarios during yeah. COVID. And yeah. I remember going through a, I know we need to leave, but oh my gosh, but what about the owner of the <laughs> right. what about the owner of the business, the building? <laughs> you know, I'm putting them in, want... I'm putting him into such yeah. a in such a situation. But it's like that's not I can't worry about that right. because because I have to stay congruent to me and I have to stay congruent to the mission and vision of the Institute and I've got to step forward. Right. And it was the perfect opportunity for, for growth. Um, yep. and I, that's what I had to do, you know, yeah. so wild. And, yeah. and a lot of people had to make that decision. Like a lot of people did. It's, a lot of people. You know, even for, you know, when I, my previous role, we were an online school with a, physical presence with yeah. the, with a building, yeah. but and we had folks, but it was like, do we go hundred percent remote? It was like, what do we do with this space now? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really interesting to, you know, yeah. and then it's funny. Cause now I was thinking like, you know, what was the lesson from that change? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, the lesson after that was everybody could re work remote. Yeah. <laughs> They can do their jobs that way, which. So Robert, I actually want to um, add in a, a piece here. Maybe this would be a, a, a place for us to start to um, conclude. You know, we're talking about something that I think everyone's listening uh, experiences is probably, I bet everyone right now can think of a hard decision they, they need to make, that they know they need to make. I bet everybody, right? It's not like we're a lack of hard decisions to make. Um, and, and so the question is, all right, Lisa, Got it. It's scary. We got it. Yes. Body's going to give us feedback. Yep. Got that one. Yep. Brain noise kicking in. Yep. Got that one. Cool. Yep. Got it. Got my community. Got my people. Great. And I'm still not jumping. So I want to, I want to offer something that might be helpful just as an actual like practical thing. Perfect. Let's hear it. The brain makes interesting assumptions about worst case scenarios. And that's what's happening. The brain is assuming that we're going to be eaten by the tiger, basically, you know, in a, in a nutshell. And so if we can actually stop and really get clear on what we think those worst case scenarios are, like what are the things that we're really, really, really afraid of? 
you know, the things we're afraid of experiencing, hearing, people leave, like what, like whatever it is. And if we can really do the work to recognize that we will be okay, even in our worst case scenario, yep. it changes the game. So um, there's so many ways of doing that. You know, play therapists, you can do your own play process around that. You can do your own sand trays, art trays, EMDR sessions, like what, like there's so many tools on, 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 on uh, you know, on that. Practically speaking, one of, one of my favorites is I just basically like, uh, open up the tiger's mouth, so to speak, and just <laughs> stick my head in it. Right. And I just, I just asked the question, great. So in my worst case scenario, what am I going to get to learn? Mm. What's the gift if in the worst case scenario, I lose the, whatever the person says, whatever I, what, okay, great. What's, what, what's it, what's the gift here? What can I learn? How can I use this? How will it support me? Um, and, and the moment I can see that there's a, there's a, there's a gift lying right there in the middle of the fear for me. The brain goes, oh, yeah. oh, okay. okay. Maybe, maybe it doesn't have to be quite so scary, but that, that's what I would say is that, um, for everyone listening, know, know that there's a, something in you that, that won't let go of your truth. It, it, it won't. And your brain noise and your body will keep kicking up feedback systems until you, you know, have the courage to make the hard decision. Don't dismiss the feedback. Keep tuning into the feedback. Um, find your support network. Find someone or someone's that you can just put it all out there. Talk about the fears. Talk about the decision. Get that. Get that support. And then, um, and then do what it takes to be able to look those fears in the eye and recognize you will be deeply, deeply okay. Deeply okay at the end of it. If your worst case came true, you will be okay. And the moment you hit that point, I guarantee you'll jump. Yep, I agree. Yep. Awesome, Robert. Lisa, as always, so nice. <laughs> wonderful spending time with you wonderful spending time with you and uh we spend so much time together anyway and it's just fun to talk to just have a conversation uh with you and um robert i i appreciate you so unbelievably much and that goes for me you are very appreciative mm -hmm. appreciated and and i really like i said earlier it's like you are an amazing woman uh i think i really I'm glad we got to spend some, this time together and talk through this. I, something that we we talk all the time, but yeah, it's nice to be able to talk about something like this. Yeah, totally. All right, listeners, my hope is that uh, you grabbed a nugget in here, something that's useful. And if nothing else, it just affirms your, your own journey of being human, what it's like. Um, and uh, take care of yourself. You are the most important toy in the playroom. And sometimes that does require us to make really hard decisions. Until next time.